Hi, this is Maylene Velasquez. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a registered play therapist, and I also specialize in working with infant and perinatal mental health. I was hoping to bring a video for those of you that are working with adult clients that are thinking about transitioning into telehealth or that might have already transitioned into telehealth, especially during this time where we're experiencing a quarantine and that we want to ensure that our clients are still receiving the services that uh, they need in order to maintain mental, emotional uh, well-being. And so I want to start this conversation with some of the basic things that need to happen for telehealth to take place. Just as with every intervention that we're applying, we want to ensure that it's in the best interest of the people that we're working with. At a time of a pandemic, when everybody's trying to ensure that they and their families are as safe as they can possibly be, many of us have transitioned into a full telehealth practice. I'm often the believer that if we have been working with a client and the relationship is progressing, the dynamic is positive and the goals are being met, then we continue working with that client. And so this means that as we're thinking about does this make sense? Is this appropriate? Things might be a little bit different right now as we're experiencing a pandemic. When it's safer again to be in the same room uh, with people and for clients to come into the office, then we certainly want to assess appropriateness. We want to assess appropriateness of presentation. We want to ensure that the clients are not going to be needing a higher level of services or that they're not going to need to come in a person. So some of the presentations where a client might be better suited for in person is where they might be at severe risk of harming themselves or someone else. Also when there might be uh, some psychosis. Also if there's any sort of cognitive different abilities that the client might be experiencing where they uh, may feel more comfortable or they may uh, be at higher benefit of meeting with somebody in person over uh, telehealth. The next thing that we want to look at is that we want to ensure that there's this accessibility, that the clients have a strong internet connection, that they have privacy where they can meet with you in a room where there's not going to be somebody else listening, especially if we're talking about another adult. And we want to check in the level of comfort that the client has to using telehealth. And so this is generally going to uh, take place as a conversation. So you're going to check in with the client, you know, how is this for you? Have you ever done telehealth before? And then you wanna go over whatever consents that you have in terms of risks or things that might happen like getting disconnected, whatever it is that you do in your practice. If you need a telehealth consent, I will link one at the bottom that you can use and um, make sure that it has everything that you need for your practice. After ensuring that clients really have strong internet, then you also want to check in, do they have headphones? Headphones are going to be really useful when you're having telehealth sessions because sometimes the sound can be a really, um, really patchy depending on, you know, sometimes like if their client's listening to you on a phone, they might have the phone set up in a certain way where it's like rubbing with maybe, I don't know, the tablecloth or if they're laying on their bed, it's rubbing on the sheets and then that's gonna make the sound really like funky for you. So it really helps me to understand my clients a lot better and for my clients to understand me when we're both wearing headphones, especially if they have speakers. If the clients do not have headphones and let alone headphones that have speakers, then you just want to make sure that the phone, uh, the computer, the tablet, whatever it is that they're using, that it's set in a way um, that's not going to block the sound so that you both can hear each other. And so during this time, some things that are important to check in with your perinatal clients is that you want to check in how are they coping? How are they dealing with either a pregnancy if there's a pregnancy with an infant or toddlers or older children, what resources do they have available for them? So we wanna think about are there uh, family members that are able to come in and support? Is there anyone else that's coming in and supporting them? I'm finding that for a lot of my clients where there was somebody coming in and supporting them, that's no longer happening because people are quarantining to ensure that they're as safe as they can be. So then for many of my clients, the resource is the other partner who is in the house. 
So don't forget to check in. How is the dynamic in that partnering relationship? Is the client able to ask for help when they need it? And are they able to receive help when it's offered? You also want to check in what are challenges that you're experiencing right now. So if your client is working full time and now working full time virtually, caring for their children who are no longer going to school, while at the same time having their partner work in the other room, then you want to check in with them. How is that working out? How are they feeling? And you want to help them to troubleshoot if there's anything that could be tweaked or could be done in a different way. A lot of the work that I do with clients when they're in relationships has to do with ensuring that we have one, healthy boundaries, and two, that clients are using a sort of communication so that they're actually having their needs communicated so that they can have their needs met. Not every need that's communicated is gonna be met in exactly the way that the client might want it. So that's where you help them to build in that flexibility, right? So this is what you want. How do you communicate this with your partner? And what happens if you communicate it with your partner but your partner is not able to meet you where you want or need them to? Then how do you help the client to create a compromise or to ask, okay, right, so this is not possible. Can you meet me halfway? Is there anything else that would be reasonable and realistic for you? And you wanna help the client to really have a conversation with their partner where at the end of this discussion, they can come up with some really real goals that they can work on. And you want those goals to be small. Oftentimes, um, I, I tell a lot of my clients that we live in a microwave society where not only do we need, but we also want things to be done immediately. Um, and especially right now when everyone is under a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress, there's this need to have the anxiety and the stress relieved. But we want to help clients to really focus on what's reasonable, what's realistic, what is based on reality, and what can they and their partner actually do. Another place to work on is giving your clients actual tools that they can walk away uh, from the session with things that are gonna make sense in their everyday life, but especially right now, as we think about the stress that many families are experiencing. So the first thing that I want all my clients to do is I want all my clients to have around a 30 minute break. And so that means that if there's two partners in the house, that maybe they take turns giving each other a 30 minute break. And this break can be for anything. It can be to take a shower, it can be to take a walk, even if it's a walk around the backyard. It can be to make a phone call or to disconnect. Ideally, during this 30 minutes, they're gonna be taking a break instead of loading the dishwashers or doing the laundry or anything else that's not gonna be relaxing. Another tool or homework that sometimes I give clients, especially when they have a little bit of trouble asking for help, is that we talk about the stressors that they're experiencing. And then we talk about one thing that they can ask for support with. And you wanna make sure that that thing is very, very small. Keep in mind that the smaller the goals that you set, the more chances of success that the client is gonna experience. And when we do something and we experience success, that's gonna increase our motivation then to work to the next goal. For parents with young children at home, you want them to think about having some sort of structure to their day that has a lot of flexibility in it. So sometimes I help parents to come up with a list of different fun activities that they might wanna do. And so this list can have maybe 10 things in it. And what I want them to do is I want them to take that list and I want them to try to do one activity each day if they're able to. And so this means that you wanna create the activities to be very simple. So this can be 10 minutes of free play with their kids or it can be playing outside in the backyard for 15 minutes. You wanna make sure that the activities that you're helping the parents to brainstorm are things that they have access to, that they're gonna be able to do, and that they can fit in to their day. So usually I'll ask after we create the plan, you know, how are you feeling about this list? 
And as you think about it, what are the challenges that you think might come up that can prevent you from doing these things on a day-to-day -day basis? And then you wanna normalize whatever is coming up. You wanna validate the client's effort. And then you wanna help them to troubleshoot. And if anything's coming up that feels so stressful, one, you wanna remove it from the list. And two, maybe you wanna even think about taking a step back, right? So we talked earlier about having something that you do every day. So maybe that becomes too much. So maybe see what's realistic for your client. Is three times a week applying a structure easier? Is it reasonable? Is it more realistic if you do it that way? This is starting where they're at and figuring out what is gonna help them to feel like they have a little bit of a sense of control in this time where none of us have any control. I also think it's very, very important to normalize um, the imperfect solutions that we're all coming up with as we think about spending all this time at home trying to work and trying to take care of children. We know what best practices in terms of screen time, in terms of nutrition, in terms of education are. But we also know that parenting is stressful, even when there's not a perinatal mental health complication. But when there is a perinatal mental health complication, everything becomes that much more difficult. And so we wanna normalize things like, parents are sitting their kids in front of the TV for hours. And maybe that's what needs to happen right now. And it's not the new normal. It's not what's gonna happen from now on. It's what we need to do right now to survive. Maybe parents are not feeding their kids what they ideally wanna feed them. And so we wanna also normalize that this is not what's gonna happen forever, but this is what we need to do right now to ensure that we're safe, that we're well, not only physically, but also mentally. Because if we're not well mentally, if we have expectations that are not gonna be accomplishable or realistic, we're gonna fall apart. And the hardest thing about falling apart is that life continues. So you experience a challenge, you feel you're worse, and then there's still children to take care of that require you to co-regulate and to feel safe. So it's very important that we're giving parents something that they can walk away uh, with, that they can use, that they can apply, that can support their well-being and also the well-being of their children. So I hope that this was useful and helpful to your work. If there's anything else that would be helpful to see, please uh, send me a message, let me know, and I will be happy to make another video. Thank you.